So a little while ago, I put out a list of over 20 different attack vectors that I specifically like to dig into when I'm opening up especially like a new code base and if if i'm trying to specifically get a finding within like the first hour or something like this a list of 20 of these things more than 20 of these things that i look for and i put that out on twitter but i wanted to make a video that goes more in depth on each of these 20 things i think there's actually 22 different attack vectors that i like to you know dig into and, and try and see if i can get anything really quick and easy if that's something I'm trying to do. So in this video, we're gonna see what are these 22 things that I kind of reach into my bag and, and try to get, if I'm trying to look for a quick, easy vulnerability to get you know, something kickstarted, if I'm doing an initial review, I just wanna get some notes and, and get some initial interesting findings for a client or for somebody that we're, we not, haven't started an actual review with just yet. Or if you wanna go and you wanna do literally every contest at the same time and you wanna try and find as many interesting vulnerabilities with as little time spent as possible, you might try some of these 22 things in order to do that. So 22 different toolbox resources, ways that you can sort of, you know, reach in your bag, uncover some quick vulnerabilities. But before we get into these 22 different things and attack factors, of course, my name is Owen. And over a year and a half ago, over two years ago, actually, at this point, I founded Guardian Audits. And ever since then, our team has uncovered literally over a thousand different findings and vulnerabilities in smart contracts with probably over around 200 of those being high and critical vulnerabilities prevented with security reviews by our team at Guardian. And of course, throughout all of that, I have spent countless, countless thousands of hours auditing smart contracts personally. And my goal with all the videos I put out and especially this one is to distill down all of that knowledge, everything I've gained from spending really a lot of time really too much time at this point reviewing smart contracts and give it to you so that you can ultimately become a much much better security minded blockchain developer security researcher whatever you're looking to be in a fraction of the time so with that out of the way let's get into these 22 different toolbox attack vectors All right, so what are these 22 different attack vectors, things that I look for to get a quick, easy off the bat finding in a brand new fresh code base? Well, let's just dive right into it. Let's get it started with the first one because we've got a lot to get through here. So the first one is of course, front running and back running. So this is something I love to look at. I think a lot of developers when they're writing code, when they're writing smart contracts, they don't tend to think about front running and back running as an attack vector because it's not really a way in which you would design your system with, with front running and back running in mind. It's not a way in which you expect the system to be used, but of course it is specifically a tool that malicious actors have at their disposal. So front running and back running, oftentimes this just has to do with you know, time dependence or like if somebody has to place a bid and then a bid can be overwritten somehow and then removed or something like this, is it possible for somebody to back run some placing a bid and then remove a bid or something like this? And this is exactly the the kind of finding that we had in our audit of Nifter's marketplace. So we could see that, you know, in this finding here, NMKT3, what could happen essentially is somebody would place a bid and then a higher bid could be placed. It, you could back run the bid being placed and then you could remove this new higher bid that you made. And now there's effectively no bid. So you could basically erase bids in the marketplace and you could even front run the owner trying to accept a bid and you could erase the bid that they're trying to accept and basically prevent the owner from actually successfully selling their NFT for a bid that was actually placed. So. That's just a quick example of, you know, what a front running, back running finding might look like. But I find that developers often don't consider this. And if it's been unaudited code, oftentimes you might find an interesting front running or back running scenario. So number one is front running and back running. Number two is using very small amounts. So 
This really will often feed into some rounding or precision loss issues as you know if i provide a single way oftentimes it's possible it will get rounded down to zero if you're using a division sign or something like this so using very small amounts i always love to test this out see if i can get the protocol into an invalid state by using you know one way or something like this and this is also something that will be covered by fuzzing if you go and you write out some invariants and you go and implement a stateful fuzzing suite this is something that will basically do a, a pretty, pretty good job of covering small amounts and their effect on the system, depending on how good your invariants are. Okay, number three here is going to be passing zero as an input. So I'm of the opinion that if zero is not an expected input, it should be explicitly disallowed just to cut off the even just the potential for something unexpected to come from putting zero as an input. Right, so that comes with addresses, that could be uint values, maybe it could even be like empty lists or something like this, or lists of zero values if that's not expected. In my opinion, ideally it should be disallowed explicitly because sometimes, sometimes when you pass zero as an input, you can actually get the system into an unexpected state. So this is just another thing that I find developers, if they're, if, especially if the code hasn't been audited already, then developers usually don't build the protocols with these malicious cases in mind. They're just building it for the use cases, you know, the spec that they're given or the spec they have in mind. And so this is another kind of scenario where maybe they didn't consider this and that can sometimes be used to yield a pretty interesting exploit. Okay, number four here is using contracts that cannot accept ether. And I say this from the point of view, the perspective of an attacker. So if I see that a system is trying to send ether somewhere, let's say it is, especially if it's like a two-step system where a keeper is executing somebody's order on an exchange, and then as a part of that execution, they have to send ether somewhere to some address. If that's an arbitrary address, well, then can we put a contract at that address that cannot accept ether? And then of course, this would DOS the attempt to send ether to that address since the contract will not accept ether unless they're using some kind of force send ether from some library like Solady or something like this, but often not what protocols are doing. So DOS by way of using a contract that cannot accept ether. Okay, number five here is gas griefing with external calls. So if I ever see an external call to an untrusted, completely arbitrary address that is not controlled by the caller, so the person who is initiating the transaction, the person who is ultimately paying for the gas, then this arbitrary address, this completely untrusted address can potentially expend a ton of gas and end up costing the transaction initiator, the one who's paying for the gas, to have to pay a ton in gas so what you want to see on these untrusted external calls is a gas limit right that is configured maybe it's configurable ideally it is configurable and it's not hard coded but there should be some sort of gas limit if especially if you're calling an untrusted address and if there's not then you may have a light and easy gas griefing with ex external calls finding okay number six here is going to be weird erc 20 tokens so you know e even like erc 777 tokens of course the classic erc 777 tokens used for the easiest findings <laughs> and of course fee on transfer tokens but one particular behavior of erc 20 tokens that i love i love to go for is blacklisted tokens and i think that's actually a little bit later on in this list so we'll talk about that then but for weird ERC-20 tokens, you know, dealing with tokens like USDT that have, you know, weird return values and stuff like this, or you have to approve it to zero before you approve it to a non-zero, stuff like this I always like to look for. And this is this is the very quick stuff that, you know, even now bot racers are just finding a lot of the low-hanging fruit here. But if you're not familiar with some of the weird ERC-20 behaviors, then you should check out my complete breakdown. We have a complete video on the channel of all the weird ERC-20 token behaviors. So you can go check that out in the description below. Okay, number seven here is gonna be price manipulation. So at the baseline level, of course, if you see 
any any contract trying to read the reserves of a liquidity pool, you know, trying to read the reserves of Uniswap or something like this, or using slot zero from a, a Uniswap V3 pool, anything, any of this behavior is an obvious immediate red flag. And that's like pretty much always an immediate finding if they're just straight up using the reserves of a liquidity pool. But more interestingly, usually, you know, there's other types of tokens like vault tokens or something like this that are based upon some sort of exchange rate that can also be manipulatable on chain. So even beyond just the liquidity pool pricing manipulation, it's interesting to look into and, and take very important note of when prices for certain tokens, like if it's a vault token, can be manipulated and to look into that attack vector deeper because more often than not, that can yield something that will actually be a you know higher critical exploit on the system. So price manipulation is number seven here. And for number eight, I talked about it earlier, we have blacklisted addresses for ERC-20 tokens. So ERC-20 tokens, you can blacklist a certain address for like, let's say USDC or USDT, they have a blacklist mapping. And if I set true for an address in that mapping, that means that, hey, you're blacklisted, you are not allowed to use USDC or USDT. I love this functionality. It's my favorite functionality of USDC and USDT because Whenever I look at, you know, some lending borrowing protocols or like a perpetuals protocol or maybe even an options protocol or anything that has liquidations in it, and obviously they need liquidations to go through, I always, always look and I try and see, is there a transfer being used in the liquidation to, let's say, either an arbitrary address or the address of the person who owns that position? And then my next question is, well, can this transfer be a transfer of USDC? or USDT or any token that has a blacklist functionality. Then if those two things are true, then I know that if I can get that liquidation function to have to transfer some blacklistable token to a blacklisted address, then the liquidation will revert. Usually the hard part to get this to be a veritable finding is getting that blacklistable token as usually it's going to be collateral for the position so that when they get liquidated and then usually you get some collateral back or something like this then when they attempt to send it to the account owner then and only then will the liquidation revert so the the tough part sometimes is getting the collateral to be that token for an account so an account that is blacklisted owns that position with that collateral usually though in some protocols there's like a deposit for so you can deposit for somebody else or there's some sort of mechanism, especially if there's a two-step mechanism where you send it to a different contract and then it gets attributed for that owner or something like this. Usually you can make it happen. You can find some way to make it happen. But if you can, then you have a, a pretty significant finding on your hands and you'd be surprised how repeatable this finding is across protocols because nobody really thinks about blacklisted tokens. Okay, number nine here. You might think that we don't have to think about this anymore, but it's underflow overflow and i'm not talking about on subtraction i'm not talking about on addition because of course now we have panic reverts when subtraction or addition would overflow underflow etc but i'm talking about casting usually casting is the sneakiest sneakiest overflow underflow culprit if you are down casting to a smaller variable especially any protocol that's trying to be hyper optimized with their slot space and they're using some like uint 128 or something like this if you can find any way to get that uint 128 something to overflow that if you're down casting from a uint 256 to a uint 128 or a uint 64 or whatever it might be if you can find some way to make that overflow then i pretty confident that you've got a critical finding on your hands so number 10 is one that is not talked about too much it is block reorgs in some instances you can have situations where blocks actually get reorganized after they've been recorded so sometimes this can yield an interesting vulnerability and it depends on how the protocol is structured so let's imagine there is a nonce just a protocol global nonce which is you know just a monotonically increasing number let's say that the nonce is at zero initially and then alice creates a pool so Alice is uh, a good actor in this case, 
And the, let's say the pool address is just based on the knots. You know, let's just keep it simple here. So assuming that the pool address is only based on the knots, and as long as you use that knots, you get the pool address, then Alice will use the knots of zero and deploy it to the pool address that is a result of the knots of zero. And then let's say, you know, two other people, Carrie and, and Alan, they are trying to use Alice's pool, right? So they know that Alice is a good actor. And so they send their funds to that pool, that address that Alice deployed to. Now, if Bob sees that there's about to be a block reorg, what he could do in some scenarios is see that if I submit this transaction, it's going to actually get recorded before Alice's. And I'm going to be the one that ends up getting to create the pool that corresponds to knots zero. And then Alice's pool will be corresponding to knots one. But Carrie and Allen's transactions are corresponding to the pool zero address, right? So they just specified, hey, send these tokens to the pool zero address. And so after a block reorg like this, Bob will end up owning the pool with the knots zero address. And that pool will have Carrie and Allen's funds in it. And Alice will have pool with the knots one address, which has zero funds in it. And so in this case, Bob could maliciously, you know, take the funds out, whatever logic is in that pool contract and Carrie and Allen, they sent their funds to somebody they did not expect to send them to. So this is a block reorg and it applies in very specific scenarios, very specific protocols where this can happen, but it is a very interesting finding nonetheless. Okay. And number 11 here is of course, Reentrancy, right? Looking at those external calls, looking at the external functions that are available, looking for non reentrant modifiers, looking for, you know, ways to reenter across contracts and all of that great stuff. If you're not completely familiar with all of the different types of reentrancy, then go ahead and, and you can check out the complete guide to reentrancy in the video down below in the description. And that will get you covered on everything you need to know about reentrancy. Okay, number 12 here, let's talk about Sybil attacks on incentives. So this is a, a really easy one. It's usually pretty obvious when you're reading like incentive reward code is, can I split up my funds into many different accounts and all like stake in this system or, or whatever the reward system is and get more rewards than if I just had a in a single account and staked with that single account. Or another way to look at this is to combine this with front running and see, okay, is there going to be a reward compound that is about to happen? Well, I will front run that reward compound, deposit a ton into the system, and then I will get the value. Let's say, let's say I deposited 99% of what is now in the vault right before that reward compound then everybody else who's in the vault before me only gets 1% of the rewards. I get 99% right after that reward compound. I'll just withdraw and walk away with all the incentives. So a few different ways to, to look at this Sybil attacks idea. And that second one there is really essentially an offshoot of stepwise jumps, which we talked about on the channel is one particular vulnerability that nobody really talks about, or at least they're not looking at it in the same framing. So moving on, flash loans. So obviously, always, always, we wanna be considering the flash loans, especially if you're looking at a concentrated liquidity protocol, if you're looking at an AMM protocol, there's a lot of interesting things you can do if you can like swap the price down to a certain tick and then you can swap it back. Oftentimes, something interesting can happen there and I think at this point, when you're looking at these kinds of protocols, invariant testing becomes extremely, extremely important, right? It will show you when invariants do not hold and usually flash loans can be used as you know, a tool in like a hacker's toolbox to get that invariant to not hold. And then usually you can see some catastrophic things occur because of that. Usually it will look like something like using liquidity from a different range in wherever the price currently is between two ticks or something like this. And then that would, you know, manifest itself like something like the, the recent Kyber swap exploit. But with that being said, flash loans are always something you want to look into. And of course they go hand in hand with price manipulation. 
So that is number 13. Number 14 is accepting data from any address. So if I am making a call to an arbitrary contract and then I am, you know, loading in that return data, you will do this if you're just making a, a high level dot call on any address, you will do this. Well, that data could be extremely large and you have to copy it into memory. So what happens is when you go ahead and you take that data, it could be just a big string of like gas, 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 gas over and over again. Take that from the return data, copy it into memory. And remember memory allocation is quadratic in nature in terms of gas expenditure. So as we have to allocate more and more memory, we spend more and more gas per marginal word of memory allocated. So that malicious address can actually get you to expend a ton of gas that you did not expect to expend even if you put a gas limit on that external call, right? Because that gas limit doesn't have anything to do with you on your contract side, loading in that return data and copying it into memory. So something to keep in mind, ideally you do not want to accept data from any external address. All right, number 15 is inflating internal accounting by sending tokens to the contract, right? So always balance, of if i ever see balance of i'm man i'm interested i'm interested i want to see balance of that is the first of three red flags for an inflation attack or it doesn't always have to be inflation attack it could be something else that is able to happen because you're able to inflate the accounting of the system but usually it'll be something like an inflation attack for which i recorded a master class that is over an hour long going into the three red flags for an inflation attack looking at it on a simple vault and then looking at, at it in a real contest with something that is not exactly uh, a, an ERC4626 vault, not a classic vault, but a more complex si system and showing you how, yes, this doesn't just pertain to vaults, like simple vault contracts. This can happen in any system. And one of the key flags is using balance of. So do not fade balance of. When you see balance of, you should get a little excited and you should also go and watch my video on the inflation attack. Okay, number 16, let's talk about forced precision loss when it really matters. So sometimes you'll see in protocols they'll have validations or things that should always hold true. So for example, in the GMX v2 system, they have a function that checks to see, hey, the balance of this market, is it what we think it is can we validate the actual balance of the erc20 balance of this market versus what we have stored in storage as our accounting so they kind of reconcile that have some validation around that and that validation should always pass so oftentimes when you see validation like that which is you know maybe more of a, a safety net or something like this that isn't maybe necessary for the system to operate and not immediately necessary for the system to even be secure, but kind of just a last layer of defense. Sometimes those validations can actually turn against you. And one interesting way to kind of make those validations fail is if you're able to manipulate precision loss in some way where it gets it to go just under the validation, specifically when you're computing the validation or something like this, and in which case you'll end up with a DOS attack, right? If you get the system into a state where that particular validation experiences some precision loss and then it thinks it's in an invalid state, then it's just gonna revert and nobody will be able to use the protocol at all, which is in and of itself an exploit, which is ironic because usually these validations are meant to prevent an exploit. So. And it's always something to look out for when you see these sort of last line of defense validations. Now, in GMX's case, of course, you know, they're, it's completely safe. They executed on it right. But a lot of times, teams sometimes will not. Okay, number 17 here is addresses that might be empty at one point, like have no byte code, yet they can house a contract at another point. So, for instance, if you are within the constructor, so if you're ex executing an external call within the constructor of a contract, or if it's you know some sort of metamorphic contract going on, or you're using create2 in some interesting way, you can engineer it such that an address has no bytecode at one point, and then it has bytecode at another point, right? Or you can just predict, 
you can easily predict, it's almost pretty trivial to predict, when I deploy my next contract and I'm on this chain, where is that going to go, right? Like it's just a deterministic formula to figure out what the public key of a contract will be. So be very, very careful when you see a system that is relying on a contract not having bytecode, immediately that should be a red flag and you should be thinking about, okay, here's all the ways that we can work around that and maybe you'll be able to cause an interesting exploit in the system. Okay, number 18 here is reverting through external calls or inputs that you can use. So different types of DOS attacks here. So first of all, to go really deep on this, I would recommend just go watch the, the four external call attack vectors videos. We go deep on D DOS, deep on denial of service, and we see all the different ways in which, you know, reverting, e.g. basically just DOS can cause issues and they can be actually critical, critical issues. Okay, number 19 here is unexpected addresses. So for instance, sometimes, especially in really big systems that have multiple contracts, and of course you can often provide an arbitrary receiver address for a lot of actions in DeFi systems, then a lot of times an interesting thing can happen when you provide one of the other contracts in the system as a receiver for let's say like a swap or an increased position, decreased position, repay, borrow, or something like this. In fact, there was one finding which I had, which was a critical finding that had to do with the GMX V2 system, which was of course, you know, this is before it was deployed and all of that. So this was while it was undergoing intense audits, which had to do with providing another contract in the system as the receiver and actually they had some validation that reverted when that was the receiver. And since this was a two-step system, what you could do is you could ultimately engineer a risk-free trade where you could control whether or not funds would be sent to the receiver. And if they were, the transaction would revert. And if you flipped a switch and you decided you wanted the trade to go through, then funds would not be sent to that address and the trade would actually go through. And you could manipulate the exchange because they had to use the prices from within the block in which you submitted the market order. And so you could get essentially just a risk-free trade out of this. So always, especially in big systems, think about those receiver addresses, think about which important addresses they could be. Okay, number 20 here is selector clashing. So especially in upgradability, patterns and upgradable systems, you want to look out for selector clashing. The simplest, quickest explanation of selector clashing is you have a proxy contract, you have an implementation contract, there is a function with a function selector, let's call it OXA, even though that's not four bytes, OXA, that functions on the implementation. There is also another function with the same function selector on the proxy, OXA, now, when somebody calls the proxy and they want to go to the implementation, they're not going to get to go to the implementation because that function with that function selector of OXA is already on the proxy. So they end up just calling that function on the proxy and you'll never get to go to the implementation. So there is selector clashing. So function selector clashing is number 20. And of course, if you want to go deeper on that, maybe you have an idea of a question like what is a function selector? Go check out the five upgradability patterns video on the channel it goes through all the different most important upgradability patterns explains what function selectors are what function selector clashing is what storage collisions are etc 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 so 21 here is just everything to do with signatures so that could be everything from like signature replay on different chains signature malleability where you can actually submit a modified signature that recovers to the same address or the fact that EC recover recovers to the zero address when you submit an invalid signature. All of these different edge cases around signatures, whenever I see signatures being used, I love to look into them because there's just so many edge cases and things that you have to be doing, best practices you need to be following, especially if you ever see somebody using EC recover in their actual smart contract not using a open zeppelin library to handle ec dsa or anything like this that is an absolute red flag and very rarely do people actually get that right with you know short signatures and, and all of these things so whenever you look into signatures 
focus on all of the different possible exploits and edge cases around that. And if you're not entirely familiar with how Ethereum signatures work and maybe what signature malleability is and what some of these edge cases are, then go ahead and you can watch our Ethereum signature introduction, introduction to Ethereum cryptography. That's a video on the channel. And then our video on signature malleability that is also on the channel. And finally, finally, number 22 here is hash collision. So when I am encoding packed to dynamic types, so let's say I have, you know, a list here of uints and a list here of uints. If I'm encoding packed and then hashing, then how do I know if it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, or if it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, right? So there is a non-deterministic combination of lists that lead to the same hash. So sometimes when you see that there's two dynamic types being used right next to each other, when we're encoding packed and you know making a hash out of it or something like that, that's gonna be an issue. There's gonna be multiple combinations of those lists that yield the same hash and that is going to be a problem so that is 22 22 of these different toolbox findings things that you can sort of reach into your bag and pull out on any system and i guarantee you if you go in you you look at a few contests with these 22 things in mind you will get something you will certainly get something so I hope that a few of these, at least hopefully a handful of these were new to you. And I hope that you remember these. Hopefully you have some place to write these down. I would definitely suggest that you go get, you know, Notion or some kind of note taking software. Personally, it's really, really helped me out when it comes to all the different little edge cases and, and protocol details and things like that. I would suggest that you, you know, watch the video back try to take some of these as notes, especially if you weren't familiar with them. And then you can refer back to that. And every time you do a review, you can have these things to look back on and say like, oh yeah, oh my God, the protocol is hashing two lists together, right? <laughs> uh, that's gonna be an issue, right? Because sometimes you forget these things, but if they're written down, you will always have them written down. So I hope this was helpful for you guys. And of course, if you're looking to join a community of people who are interested in smart contract security, if you're interested in taking your interest to the next level, you want to become a smart contract security researcher, or if you're just a blockchain developer who's interested in security, first of all, I appreciate you for being invested in security. But if you want to join a community of people across the world who are also interested in security, you know, ask whatever questions you have, get help from other folks then go ahead and join our absolutely free community of security researchers at lab.guardianaudits.com. You can fill out a quick form and apply to join. This is absolutely free. And of course, if you're looking to become a smart contract security researcher, like a, a senior auditor in six months, then I basically distill down everything that I wish that I knew from the beginning, put it into a video for you and you can get that down below in the description if that's something that you're looking to do. So with all that being said, I look forward to seeing you next time.